coaches have the foresight to invest into the community on many, many, many levels and say, this is our position, this is our platform, and we're going to stay here, and, and we're going to really do, like, the fact that they don't advertise the Red Bull Music Academy and take credit for it, I think makes people really support it more because it says they're not trying to, they're not trying to play us out because sooner or later, artists are going to get offended if they keep feeling like they're, they're getting taken for granted just for a check. That won't last. Um, well, I take that back. <laughs> the check is powerful. As long as there's money, the check will be powerful. Uh, as long as there's a system of, of cash and capitalism. Uh, but I think the, 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 the underlying danger is that talent will rebel um, and there will be a movement to not be down with the brand because it makes you seem whack or corny. That's what I think potentially could happen. But then I could be wrong because I think with the economy and everybody being so 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 uh, hard pressed for food, uh, brands are in a great position. There, there's a balance though. Like this is exactly why I want to work with an artist that doesn't work out and you want to work with a brand. It just doesn't work. In the end, like in the end, you can buy them, but then there's resentment, and that comes off in everything. So like if they if they wanted Nike, but right. Take Swiss came. They're still going to want Nike. Right. And it would, it, something has happened recently, so this is kind of to the point here. Dr. Dre's new video. It's a long-form video. Hughes Brothers shot it. Huge budget. It's, it's unbelievable. It's online right now. If you guys haven't seen it, go see it. He's wearing K-Swiss in the video. And, and Dr. Dre came to us and said, Hey, hey, I want to wear, wear your shoes. After he shot the video. No, no, no. Before the video. And I had a real challenge with saying, all right, every time I've seen Dr. Dre, he's never worn our, our stuff. So why are we going to do this? And then we can, we, you know, oh, the metrics, this, 25 million views. All right, I get that. But is he going to wear this tomorrow? Because if he isn't, we shouldn't do it. I don't care if he's doing it for free. And we didn't pay a lot of money, so it wasn't really about the money. It was about the organic connection. Do I want to be connected to Dr. Dre? Absolutely. Eminem's in the video. It's, it's, it's a great look for us. But it wasn't, a, it wouldn't be a great look if we went out and paid him a, a boatload of money to deficit finance his video. And then as he, the shot was over, he walked over and put on another brand. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened, but that is a, an example of, you know, Dr. Dre, this video is going to be probably the video, the biggest video of, of the quarter or the half, the first half of the year. And it's, it's from his new album that he hasn't had out in, I don't know, 10 years he hasn't had a record. But we still wouldn't have done it if we didn't think he was going to adopt the brand moving forward, which he says he will. It looks like he's going to, and, and everybody wins. I think ultimately, you know, this, this the one thing that if you kind of walk away from this is to understand that there are... There are all sorts of different types of brands, and there are all sorts of different types of relationships. And 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 you know, Ryan, you you speak to kind of a very you know specific and sophisticated and qualitative relationship and understanding of how the artist community works and what you want to do to work with them. And yes, you know you have product sales goals and all that stuff, but but the way that you're approaching this is on a whole nother level than say. You know, the Smirnoff guys. And, uh, and Josh and I have been in all sorts of those meetings where you, know, you talk about being the only black guy in this fancy restaurant. Well, I'm usually the only black guy in these meetings. Marketing departments that are deciding literally how they're going to approach an entire ecosystem of consumers, brown or black or hipster or whatever, and there's not one representative in the room. And you're wondering, like, wow, you're like dividing up the world. And it's kind of like, there ain't the world people here, <laughs> and there is there is going to always be that that goes on. And the companies I think that do that a great job, Scion, you know, Red Bull, what Ryan does with K Swiss, what he's done with Puma in the past. I mean, these are when you get brands that will be are comfortable being more adventurous and taking chances. And and um, again, profit motive does not leave the the table. Of course, it's there, but. They are in the commit. They're committing to understand really the arena in which they play, and it usually starts because there's just a very uh, there's just a there's an individual there that is driven to do it right, 
uh, which you know we could probably pick ten people right now that are at Nikes and all these types of companies that have that individual there or a team of those individuals, or it's like a founder, you know, Red Bull, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, an incredibly well-timed, smart, adventurous, fortunate individual that launched a company and started a whole category and really never had to answer to shareholders or anybody and still doesn't and that's why he can start things like the Red Bull Music Academy or let you know a couple of you know crazy Germans start a Red Bull Music Academy with no real how's this connect to cans? How's this what does this do? But twelve years later they're still doing great stuff, you know, the way they want to do it. It has to kind of be that DNA and if it isn't, well then you know you guys or everybody will see it, I think, and be repelled by it and it probably won't work the same way. We've got uh, some time for questions. I'd like to open it up. Um, you guys? Yes, in the back. Oh, if we can use these mics, I think I'm supposed to encourage <coughs> these some microphones. So I guess my oh, so I guess my questions for Ryan and Josh and Josh, and it's a lot about branding, like Scion, for instance. I'm from New York City, and I don't know how many times, you know, I've gone to, like, a free Scion show or party or gotten, like, a free Red Bull, like, on the street in Williamsburg somewhere. But, <laughs> but I don't know, I'm, like, thinking about, like, the way you guys brand. Like, I was noticing um, that you guys tend to, these brands tend to hold events in, like, major urban cities. Like, you know, the one where it's not, it's marketed towards my demographic, young, urban, young professionals, uh, it, but they're not going to buy Scion. They're not going to, you know, buy into, the, like, the actual branding. So I, I'm kind of figuring out, like, what's the point of, like, branding to us? Is it more to that kid you guys said, like, Dayton, Ohio, like, those kids who look like the kids in New York? Do you want them to like, answer, do you, you want, want them to like buy into the lifestyle that doesn't really exist so that they can like <laughs> buy the scion because that's what they think the people in LA and New York you are going to try to hire you. Yeah. <laughs> well. That's my thing. And also like I don't know like it's kind of because I've noticed too like me and my friends when we see that stuff like we know you're marketing to it towards us and yeah we'll buy into it but like not really and you know like because the sign thing is like really funny because there's like an adult swim show Lucy the daughter of the devil and like Jesus is a DJ and he's throwing a huge party and it's like and we're sponsored by Scion like you know what I mean you guys are with bikes and everything so you're known for those like branding efforts and they're really cool but it's like who are you like marketing to like how does this help your brand like, and the product you're trying to push. Like, the Dr. Dre thing makes sense, because it's like, if my brother saw, like, and the sneakers looked good, like, they would go and buy them, you know? But I don't get with a car company like that. Um, I win, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, you, you bring up a good point, which is that each product is really different, and what it takes to get somebody to buy a certain pair of shoes or to buy a certain drink is very different than what it takes to get them to buy a certain car, right? So, um... You know, K-Swiss is going to go into this with a, a much very different perspective than, say, a car company. But uh, the short answer is yes. It, 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 is, it is absolutely um, the brands that, that invest in music. And what I find interesting about this conversation is the list is really short. Um, if you look at all the companies out there versus the ones who are making a consistent and thoughtful investment into music culture, it's really short, and even after 10 years plus of this happening, it's, it's, I think it speaks to how hard it is to do that right, and how, um, you know, what a, what a big challenge that is to those uncool kids that Victor meets. But, yeah, the reality is, sign, I don't want to speak for sign, but the goal of that kind of campaign is not to sell a bunch of cars in Williamsburg, or to get... Victor and Jazzy Jeff and all these guys that have no business driving science to drive science, right? That's, that's absolutely not the goal. But it is an understanding of kind of how influence works and that when the cool kids in Williamsburg adopt something, then the kids in Dayton are paying attention to that. But that's well, like my another... thing kind of because it's like they're not really adapting it. They're taking advantage of the fact that they know you're marketing to them. So it's like... Yeah, it actually doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you know what happens? Scion, all, all they have to do is actually just say, hey, we threw a party in Williamsburg. And it's all the kids that don't live in Williamsburg that go, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and it's the kids so, in Williamsburg who, 
you know, and post the flyers to their Twitter pages or, or yeah, share their experiences. Yeah. All right, and I, they sorry, can, I have another question. Um, one more, and then we got it. Well, okay. yeah. But, like, there's, so, you know, Green Label Sound and Converse and all these, like, brands who are now a lifestyle brand, um, branding to, again, young hipsters, young urban professionals, um, and, uh, so I'm confused about, like, how is this ethical with musicians and the artists involved? Like, the cool kids, like, I was reading the Green Label Sound thing, and, you know, they also have a PR kind of attached to them that's completely different from the label. They're also involved with the magazine, and obviously, like, they can get press that way, and, I don't know, I'm confused as to how, like, this actually benefits the artists in the end, when it's, like, something where it's a, such a specific marketing campaign, where, like, the cool kids came up on the blogs, everyone was really interested in them because they were like young hip hop kids wearing skinny jeans, which was not happening. You know well, what that, I mean? That, like, that was the cool kids. And now that's kind of died down, yeah. but they're on this weird marketing path to like what really isn't like their audience. Not all, not all these things work. We have to remember <laughs> that too. You know, just that it gets done doesn't mean it sold anything or made anybody any better. It, you know, and one of these things about the parties, like why do brands throw parties? Let me tell you why some brands throw parties, because that's where they want to hang out. That's where the brand sees themselves. That's literally where the person they hired, 28-year-old hipster that they hired, fuck, I want to spend some money in Williamsburg, because I want to be cool in Williamsburg. It comes down to just some very, because 30 other people around them have no clue and they've just let this kid go to town. And yeah, sometimes that stuff does that's, happen. That's no different than the sponsorship of the U.S. Open or the Super Bowl or, or the Fashion it. Week, right? These are Or Sports it, Illustrated, you know, swimsuit edition. Like, why are you absolutely. advertising it? Because I want to go to the party. <laughs> right. I think I mean, it happens think all also, the time. I think you also have to, the, the, the group of people that are doing the events, it depends on their level of sophistication as promoters and as business people. Yeah. Because one of the things that I go through as a promoter is, is not allowing brands to come in because I want to charge. Because I want you to pay because you want to be there. I know that the experience will be better if there's 500 people that want to be there versus 2,000 that are coming because they got an email. That, that me, as a very specific uh, type of entertainment provider, is important because it's very challenging for me to suddenly program a night for 2,000 people who have 2,000 different interests. I'm not doing that broad-based type of entertainment like sports. I'm doing a very specific thing. My sound, my style requires everyone to be in tune with me. Uh, so that's the challenge of me doing branded events because a lot of times, like Hennessy, you say, hey, Hennessy, we're into artists. We have Hennessy artistry. All right. <laughs> that's for black folks, too. I have yeah. more questions, but I'll sure to stalk you. Yeah, yeah we need another. We need somebody else. <laughs> there, was a, there was a hand that went up with me. Who was the first hand? Okay. I don't know what that was. You're out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious. I'm not going to walk over there. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, it seems to me that in some ways, especially when it's like Scion, you're investing in sort of cultivating a scene, that, and I'm thinking about like format radio and the fact that really a lot of music delivery has always been free and sponsored by mm -hmm. advertisers, as in the case of radio. And it's just that the cultivation of the sound or the you know, format was done by programmers and then signed on. So I guess what I'm asking is, to what degree have the advertisers actually then become sort of formatters in themselves, or is it is the dynamic totally different? Are, are you speaking in terms of the, the, the financial relationship between sponsors and radio stations and music? Yeah, I guess I'm... I'm it's less directed. It's more reflective. I think the advertising is way more reflective and less directed than, say, formatting. Because formatting was back when there was just a one-way communication. Radio form, you know, people would decide and then deliver. And you really couldn't, how did you get another radio station? And if you didn't live near KCRW or something, then you had your local radio. Whereas advertising is way more sophisticated to be reflective. So they do the hipster parties because they know that hipsters are the hardest to reach crew or something, and they work with Vice because they know that Vice is the only translation to that community. And it's, and so it's, they're, they are programming, but they're, they're programming in a reflective way, much more so than just a directive way. Because advertisers, are, they do not consider themselves sophisticated enough to tell 20-year-olds what they should be listening to. There's no freaking way. Not yet. 
<laughs> You're right. Yeah, but, <laughs> not yet. But, but the thing is, look, brands are incredibly risk averse. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about, uh, I know earlier we were talking about this sort of music created by labels versus music created by brands. And I think, you know, when I was, when I was in the music business in the early 90s, they used to say that uh, a good a &R was a guy with 10 flops and one hit. A great a &R was a guy with 10 flops and two hits. Right? And so, because the music industry, most statistically, almost every record that's ever come out has been a flop, has lost money, has failed to really connect with an audience. Right? Brands can't afford that. If, if Coke puts out a music initiative that's, you know, their big priority for the quarter and it doesn't connect, there are there are serious repercussions, right? And absolutely, like the, these big companies count on every, the, you know, a, a near perfect shooting record when it comes to this stuff. So there, there's no way that that in, in our near future, a brand is going to decide to start programming and trying to call the shots about what kids are listening to. They just don't want to take that risk and they frankly don't really care. Um, it, it's much more about being right pretty much every time. But radio didn't do that either, you, you know what I mean? Like radio sort of curated from what the labels did, so I... Uh, you know, radio, so radio was a very dirty business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's like <laughs> complicated... Very comparison. dirty business. The music business, the, the music business has collapsed because it's a dirty business. It Thank you for saying that. It was, it was a rotten <laughs> business and it got caught up in Which is a, uh, yeah. an emerging yeah. culture that yeah. was trying to get away from that. We have, we have just a few minutes left for one last question. Yeah, and this is a question that, like, Vic Victor touched upon this, and it's something, like, maybe I struggle with and other people struggle with in general, but how do you reconcile making money versus having a social conscience or social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the growing challenges that, that we're facing in this country? You see Wisconsin, you see the Middle East, you see the possibility of the U.S. using its position, of the potential threat, you know? How do we kind of reconcile, like, this? Because it's sometimes just like, man, like, I want to buy Nike, but, you know, this and this. Or, and, I, you know, I love all these brands, too. Who doesn't? We grew up in the U.S. and, like, you know, it's associated with different subcultures, punk and hip-hop and all this, and having bands and flipped up brims and flannels and just, like, Nike high top. It's like, how do you, you know, how do we deal with this? Like, you know, for me, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot because of, of course, what's going on in the world, but also because I see a lot of the world close up and personal. I, I just think that we're at a point in time in human culture where gray is our reality. And it's up to us to accept gray as our reality, which means it's not about this is my position. Like for, we've been, we're all, all old enough here that have been raised in the USA that said everything we do in the USA is right. And everything everyone else does in the, outside of the USA is wrong. But then inside of that is there's a, there's like, there's this kind of a USA experience and this kind of USA experience. Everyone takes a position of that being normal. But now, suddenly we're faced with the in-between as being normal. And we're having to think. We can't just rely on what we were taught back in the day or, or you know, what we assumed or what, what we have learned about based on our own travels as being the, uh, the normal perspective. And the rest of the world is like... All the things you guys have been hearing about us are wrong. So you have to see where we're coming from, and we all have to look at each other and really look deeper into each other. I said this earlier. It's just about to be a, a whole new world, really. And it's, a, it's a, I think, it versus it, uh, a, a sensation of a lot of people having of it being a panic. Of, I'm worried about 2012. Is it really the end and all that? I look at it more as an opportunity for us to embrace the uncertainty of it all. I think that's the exciting part. Me, as a musician, I have no idea where the music business is going. I spent my whole life literally making music. And then one day, every company disappeared. Holy shit! <laughs> right? Major, independent, whatever. It all went like... Whoosh. And then, on top of it, the product disappeared. The machines that we used to play the product disappeared. Everything disappeared. Oh my goodness. So now, me and every other artist is forced with this idea of, do we love music? Really? Do I really love this? Or was I doing it to make money? The, those of us who really love it 
are still going. But the trick is, there's a new group that love the money, that are doing it a little better than us, in, in a certain way, a certain real way. And I'm learning from them. I'm watching them. Because what I have and they don't have is I have a passion for the art. And so there's, that's another gray area where these, these money-hungry people who do anything to be famous and sell whatever and don't necessarily have a particular skill, I, have a, I believe that they're going to hit a brick wall because everyone that is following them will grow up and need more. And then the people that have ability to, to present proper art or, or uh, creativity with some depth will have a chance to catch up but we can't be on the sidelines with a frown. We have to be paying attention to what they're doing. So it's like everything is sort of interconnected. It's, it's definitely a yin-yang kind of moment in time in history, I think. And, and business is a reflection of, of culture. Thanks, so my spin. A great place to end. Um, Victor, thank you, the whole panel. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. <laughs>